you know, we've got a chain of volcanoes in the Cascades. Uh, Mount St. Helens is one of the, the more active. It is the most active one. And in 1980, there was a, a landslide, uh, effectively. They'd been a growing bulge. They knew, they knew there was activity. There was a lot, of, a lot of seismic activity around the mountain. And they'd cleared the area. It was to the point where um, you know, they, they'd moved people out of what their expected blast zone was. Um, and so in May of 1980, uh, massive landslide happened. It you know removed the overburden on top of a, a high pressure zone, and you had this massive eruption. So basically, the mountain turned upside down. Yeah, um, and it wiped clean the the uh, landscape that was sitting on the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> it, it kind of took the side of the mountain and flipped it upside down. Indeed, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it <laughs> shook it all up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So. We have a mountain that's been turned upside down. Yes. What does that do to the rivers and communities downstream? So we actually we get uh, a lot of rain up on the mountain. So we have a big orographic effect right. that goes on. So one of the things we all know about the Northwest is you get rain. Yeah, you know the the overall quantities, uh, you know, in Portland aren't aren't really that impressive. But you move up on the mountains oh, yeah. where they they catch the marine layer coming in, and it's really impressive, right? So Mount St. Helens is one of those, and. Uh, so now you've got this this flipped over andesitic mountain, and so it's it's um, you know a lot of ash, a lot of pumice, a lot of sand, a lot of so what I'm trying to tell you is a lot of non cohesives yeah. and light specific gravity non cohesives that have no rivers, that have no valleys. Like it, how the water is going to get off all this water that's coming in is going to get off of this landscape is undefined at this point. Uh, it, you know, in this process, you have all this water moving on the sediment without without rivers and valleys and terraces and vegetation and anything that kind of helps keep a you know your, your 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 landscape together and it just moved an ungodly amount of sediment <laughs> all that sediment a lot of that sediment mobilized and started moving downstream um and so what's downstream what's downstream is um a bunch of population that's right down um uh, uh, near the confluence with the Columbia. You, there were communities down on the Cowlitz that uh, were experiencing rapid aggradation of sands in their, in their river and creating flood risk. So what is an SRS and how does that play into the story? All right, so uh, you know, the, Corps, the Corps looked at a bunch of different alternatives and the, the alternative that, that moved forward, that got implemented, was to build a, effectively a large dam um, the sediment retention structure, so the SRS. Uh, the SRS, by you know, all intent, it, it is a large dam. It is over 100 feet high. We think it's about 110 feet over the historic Thalweg. Um, and it's got, uh, you know, it had a pool that was a couple miles long when it yeah. was originally built, 100 feet deep. And the intention was never to have a still water pool. Right. The intention was to strip sediment out of the, uh, out of, you know, out of the load that's moving downstream and capture it and send out clearer water so that you don't overwhelm the, the downstream reaches with sediment and manage the deposition. So, um, you know, this was built, I think it became finalized in 89. It was, um, and construction started in the, in the mid eighties, about 86, uh, and, and became a fully active structure in 89. The still water pool. So, I mean, you know, 110 foot high dam, uh, was full of sediment, full of sediment to the extent that at least sediment was spilling over the spillway. Uh, first time the spillway became active was in 96. Oh, wow. So in, in 96 was a very hallmark year in the Pacific Northwest. It's one of our big, it was roughly a hundred year event on the Columbia. Um, one of those hydrologic, big hydrologic events. And you can only imagine, you know, the, the mountain had only been 16 years since it had been flipped upside down. Yeah. A lot of available sediment. Yes. There had been virtually no vegetation yes. recovery. Uh, incisional processes were still extraordinarily active. And uh, it kicked out a, a huge amount of sediment and, um, and had filled the, the reservoir to the point where water spilled over the spillway. Now, it was a couple years later before sediment had moved, you know, filled the reservoir to the point where it was sediment level to the spillway crest. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where we've been. And it's always been a fascinating thing. And it's the nice thing about talking to sediment people is that, that, that I battle over this comment all the time, but everyone here will get it. It's not full of sediment. Right. <laughs> it is just full to the spillway crest. The valley needs to grade. Right? right. So, uh, and furthermore, the sediment that was trapped behind the SRS while you're still trying to move water through an outlet works, 
uh, it was trapping sediment that's not a problem downstream. You know, medium sands and coarser really are your problem downstream. So if you're, pass- if you're trapping silts at all, right. that would have passed. That's the a waste system. because that won't end up depositing. Right. But to create an outlet works that has the capacity to hold water surfaces down so you can selectively trap is outsized outlet work. So they just accepted that they were going to trap a lot of unnecessary material. Yeah. And really that's the challenge going forward is how do you selectively trap the problematic material without, uh, you know, without trapping more than you need. So that was an excerpt from my conversation with Chris Nygaard, who is the sediment transport specialist at the Portland District of the Corps of Engineers. For more of that conversation or for more conversations with subject matter experts in sediment transport, river mechanics, or fluvial geomorphology, check out the podcast website in the description below or subscribe to the RSM River Mechanics podcast in any podcast app.